Hey everybody, welcome to our Instagram Live happy hour. Uh, this is the first of three half hour um, experiences that we are going to be doing with cocktails with our friends from Luxco. And I am going to be interviewing um, Dustin Paris. He is a well-known bartender from, uh, from here in St. Louis. And so I am going to invite him to join us. Let's see. Hold on one sec. This is our first one, so bear with me. I'm looking for... So the Ezra Brooks account is the one that we are going to be connecting with. Hi, everybody. I see all of you joining. It's good to see you. We're going to be making some really fun cocktails today. All right. So Dustin, um, he is the brand manager for the team at, um, at Ezra Brooks. And so I'm, let's see if we can find him. Dustin, where are you? <laughs> We're actually gonna be making three really different cocktails today. We're gonna be doing a, um, just a mint julep, the classic. We are also going to be making a, um, a David Nicholson 1843 traditional highball. And then the last one that we're going to be doing is a porch paloma, which happens to be the most popular um, cocktail in Mexico. So I'm excited for him to um, to show us all of those. So Dustin, if you're listening to me, if you could request to join, that would be fantastic. Let me see if I can find you. Where are you, Dustin? All right. <laughs> oh, I can see all of you guys. Hi, there you are. I see you. Can you see me, Dustin? I'm waiting for him. I saw him say, I'm here. Hey, there you are. There you go. Hi, how's it going? Sorry about the technical difficulties there. I was waving at you. <laughs> No worries. There are just a bunch of people kind of stacking on top. So we got you. We're connected. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you today? I'm terrific. I'm excited about these cocktails. I have all of my beverages lined up. I'm glad that it's it's happy hour on a Thursday. There it is. That's <laughs> it's, a, it's a weekend now. Why not? So. Essentially. When yeah. I was in college, Thursday was always kind of like the day before Friday. So you treated it kind of like the weekend, sort of. Exactly. So we'll, pretend like, we'll pretend like that right now. Friday can, Friday can take care of itself. We're here. I know. Yeah. So the, the first cocktail you're going to do is a julep. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, we're going to do a traditional mint julep. We're going to use our 90 proof Ezra Brooks. And uh, I'm going to get a little help from my new friend here. This is my mint plant, <laughs> Chucky Kernel Mint. So I named it Steve Akeley. Nice. Uh, this is, this is my plant that helped me make all my juleps. So, you, uh, you ready to get started? I'm ready. I actually have a little pour of the bourbon that you're going to be using. Oh, so I can kind of taste alongside. Well, I, next time we do this, I'll be sure to have an extra glass. Because yeah, you're you right. <laughs> a taste of whiskey does sound pretty nice. I know. But, uh, so we're going to make a very traditional mint julep. Right, juleps are traditionally a uh, a sweet drink. Right, it was designed specifically to help the medicine go down. Juleps are a word that refer to sweetener added to bitter medicines. And so, because back in the day, whiskey wasn't always as good as it is now. Right, <laughs> and so whenever whiskey needed a little help, we decided to start making juleps. So the first thing I'm going to do is take some freshly picked mint. I got these right off my plant. I'm going to bunch it up in my fingers, give it a little squeeze to start breaking those oils. Mm -hmm. I'm going to rub it all the way down the edge of this glass. Get all those mint oils going, get those aromatics. So and rather than, Dustin, is it rather than muddling? 
You do that? Uh, with, sometimes I use a muddler, uh, but muddling's very aggressive. And whenever you're making this drink, it's not like I'm trying to juice a bunch of blackberries in the bottom of this. I just want that oil to come out. Okay. And whenever you use a nice high proof whiskey, like the 90 proof Ezra Brooks, uh, which yes, please have some, the, uh, the alcohol will actually pull the oils right out of the leaves, right? Mm -hmm. so we'll do about two and a half ounces of whiskey to make this drink. I'm gonna add one ounce of it right now and let it start pulling that mint flavor out of the whiskey. So while the alcohol and the mint do their thing, we are gonna add just a little bit of a simple syrup that I made. This is real easy, folks. It's a cup of sugar and a cup of water. You know, people say boil it. I, do, I think if you boil it, you get a little bitter. If you just warm it up a little bit uh, till the sugar dissolves, you're good to go. So now I got whiskey, mint, and sugar in this glass and everything's doing its job, all right? But we need ice. Crushed ice is very, very important for this drink. And there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, you know, when, when I was running bars, I always had three ice machines at every bar, and one of them always made crushed ice for me. Unfortunately, I don't have that in my house. Uh, <laughs> trust me, that's on my dream house list. But I do have what we call a Lewis bag, and, uh, and you need a mallet, something to crush it with. A lot of people will use their muddler, or I, sometimes I used to use my kid's t-ball bat. But uh, today I'm breaking out my bun hammer, all right? <laughs> so this is actually a tool that distillers use. This is how you open a whiskey barrel. Yeah. Right? They have a little cork or what they call a bung in the middle of the, of the barrel. And if you hammer it on both sides, that cork will pop right out. I love I, that. I use this hammer to open up the very first single barrel of whiskey I ever handpicked. So it's a very special hammer to me. Nice. Yeah. It looks like it's well used. So where is um, the Ezra Brooks made? Uh, where we made, made all the bar and bourbons are now under one roof. All right. We make them in Bardstown, Kentucky at Lux Road Distillers. It, uh, we opened our distiller in the last five years. And uh, we now make Ezra Brooks, David Nicholson, Rebel Yell, uh, and we also blend Blood Oath there as well. But, uh, you know, we used to do a few contract distillers, uh, mostly still in Bardstown, Kentucky. But uh, now we're very proud to have our own distillery and have all our whiskeys under one roof. Nice. We so, got time for one more question before it gets loud. <laughs> okay, so my next question. So talk about the what distinguishes bourbon from, well, bourbon from whiskey. I mean, obviously bourbon is whiskey, but it's a special, a special class. So tell us what makes bourbon bourbon. All bourbon is whiskey, not all whiskey is bourbon. Bourbon is the most quantified spirit ever produced. There are more rules and regulations you have to follow to make bourbon than any other spirit in the world, all right? If you want to make vodka, you throw something in your still, you distill it, whatever comes out, put it in a bottle, you can call it vodka, why not? Uh, the definition of, of whiskey is distilled spirit that has touched oak. So you could drill holes in the bottom of an oak barrel, run your distillate right through there, and then you can put the word whiskey on your label because it touched oak. Bourbon must be aged for a minimum of two years in a new American white oak charred barrel. Somebody who made barrels for a living was at that meeting. They did very <laughs> The barrel lobby had something exactly. to say about that. We also control what you can and can't put in your mash bill or recipe list. So you have to be between 51 and 90% corn. Uh, since we tell you what you can put in it, we tell you how high you can distill it. You cannot distill bourbon at over 165 proof, and it cannot go into a barrel at over 125 proof. Mm. So you distill it, and then you gotta water it down a little bit, put it in that barrel for two to four years, but my absolute favorite part about bourbon is that it is a genuine handmade American product. You are not allowed to add anything to your bourbon post distillation uh, that changes the flavors or the colors. The only thing you can add is pure water for the purposes of controlling proof. So if you make whiskey, you put it in a barrel, you open it up four years later, if it doesn't taste the way you want it to taste or smell the way you want it to smell or look the way you want it to look, you can't change that. You have to. 
Well, and also because it's in new American oak and it's made using corn, that also really distinguishes it as an American spirit, I would say. You, that is true. You can only make bourbon in the United States. Uh, at one point in time, you could only make bourbon in Kentucky. But in my lifetime, that's actually changed to open up all of the United States. Yeah. If you'll excuse me, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> take out a little take out my work me out on this ice real quick. Okay. So crushed ice is key. You know, <laughs> We have a comment here that says, Dustin with the brick with the bung hammer, unreal. I love it. <laughs> I just watched Avengers, so I'm channeling my inner Thor. <laughs> so. I think that's a lot more fun than having an ice machine in your house. I think you, even if you had an ice crusher and like in your refrigerator, you should still use that bung hammer. Absolutely. And it gives you something <laughs> while you wait for the, for the whiskey and the mint to, to really get to know each other. So now that we've done that, look at that. Took those nice cubes, got this great pebble going on here. So, and whenever you're making a julep, it's all about just having a whiskey snow cone. This is a summer drink. This is a Southern drink. This is the official drink of the Kentucky Derby. Um, you know, they'll make about 120,000 mint juleps in one day. Unbelievable. That is absolutely unreal. They also sell about 250,000 hot dogs. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, these are, these are big drinks. Um, these have been around since the 1700s, uh, but it was really a, a Virginian uh, congressperson who went to in DC that started drinking these that really popularized the drink. He had one of his favorite bartenders at one of those fancy DC uh, bars start making these for him. Next thing you know, all the rich white people were drinking them, and now it's it's quite the thing across the globe. So we already have an ounce of whiskey and our half ounce of simple syrup in there. Okay. So now I'm just gonna really slowly drizzle uh, some of this uh, whiskey on top. And again, you're just trying to make a snow cone. You're just gonna fill it all up. Notice we're gonna lose a lot of our ice while we do it. Nice. nice proof bourbon and crushed ice. Uh, 90 proof bourbon wins every single time. So, and you're using the real julep glass, which is metal, right? Yes, uh, a nice real julep glass is metal. Um, and this is the traditional design. Uh, we actually did a really great promotion. You know, we were talking about the Kentucky Derby. It was so the Kentucky Derby is traditionally always the first Saturday in May. So, you know, May 2nd would have been the day. Um, I was really glad to see that the Derby, even though it's been postponed until September, uh, they still decided to do a first Saturday event. Uh, they actually did a virtual horse race uh, with all the Triple Crown winners to see who was the ultimate horse champion, uh, which was pretty fun. But it was a really nice stay safe, stay home celebration that raised a lot of money. So uh, Ezra Brooks here in Missouri, uh, we actually had a few on-premise accounts that picked up some Ezra Brooks and some julep cups that we made, and they sold julep kits to How the fun. home. Yeah. So anybody that has one of my Ezra Brooks julep cups can actually uh, post pictures of themselves in their finest derby garb and uh, win a trip to the distillery to Bardstown to come see us. Oh, fun. That's great. And uh, so what is, your, what is your plan with your mint? Are you going to stick it in a pot? Uh, eventually, I'm, I'm trying to plant a herb garden outside. It was one of those things where you're like, well, we're, I have all this time now, right? It's a kind of project. I don't have any more time than I ever have. So no, I, I, I know. I had plans to, to read some books that had just been sitting on my shelf and do, you know, organizing my closet, doing all these things, and I'm busier than ever, it feels like. It turns out work's still a thing. Yeah. So, so I got some sprig of mint right here. These are the very tops of the plants, all right? And we're going to use this as a garnish. But I like to do one. You saw I rubbed the mint on the inside of the glass. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to, you call it spanking. I'm going to spank the mint all around the rim of this glass to really just coat the glass in aromatics of mint. So that way, as I bring this up uh, to take my sip, you really, really get that mint right off the top. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to stick it right in there. And that, my friend, is a nice, clean, nice. mint julep.
That is beautiful. So um, we have one of the folks who's listening. She says she has a couple of different kinds of mint growing in her pot. Is there a particular kind that is traditional or a particular kind you would recommend? Um, I have three kinds of mint at my house as well. I always do a berries and cream mint, uh, which is really good. I would use that one for mojitos. Uh, you know, that has a lot of those, those mint aromatics. Uh, this is uh, officially called Kentucky Kernel Mint. And this was my first year uh, growing any of this. And it is supposedly specifically designed for mint juleps. Cool. So Kentucky Kernel Mint uh, will actually make the best mint juleps according to plant scientists somewhere. Um, and I also always grow chocolate mint. Mm -hmm. If you don't know about chocolate mint, please grow yourself some because it has been a real game changer. Um, I know I, I drink a lot of whiskey professionally, uh, but I do enjoy uh, a nice glass of vodka from time to time. And uh, if you take a couple of those chocolate mint leaves, slap them up and put them in your vodka, you got a good drink. So. Nice and simple. That's good. Exactly right. So next up, are we, talk about simple. Next up, I think this is your favorite cocktail, right? The, this, um, the highball? Blue favorite cocktail of all time. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna make one too. Simple, it's pure. Look at the glass that I'm gonna be making mine in. Oh, there you go. I love it. So, <laughs> I, I actually just picked up some David Nicholson branded glassware. Oh, like nice. Um, so yeah, we're gonna make a traditional highball, all right? And a traditional highball is essentially two ingredients. It's whiskey, it's club soda, uh, and I like to put a nice lemon zest into mine as well. Um, but I love this drink because I love drinking whiskey. And in the summertime when it's 112 degrees and I'm trying to sit outside and listen to the Cardinals if they're playing on the radio, uh, you know, I, a, a glass of warm room temperature whiskey doesn't always cut it when you're in 112 degree sunshine. So this is going to be a cool, refreshing, full flavor whiskey drink. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. I always got to get this ice scooping out of the way. So if you if you got your cup, fill it with ice. So that way we can both be really loud at the same time. <laughs> I actually pre-portioned my two ounces of whiskey into my cup so that I wouldn't be like running all over the place. So I already have my two ounces of That's clever. So speaking of which, I left my jigger right over here. But. So yeah, we uh, we got a glass of ice. We're gonna do two ounces of whiskey. Mm -hmm. So uh, a traditional, a legal pour would be an ounce and a half of whiskey. I always tend to go with two ounces of whiskey because you know. Because why not? Depletions are key. Plus, this is hundred proof whiskey. So why not add that extra half ounce to really get where you want to go? Uh, if you'll notice, uh, if you look at a lot of what we do at Lux Road Distillers, we often make higher proof whiskey. Um, we really do that because we just think our whiskey is so delicious. And so why would you want to water down something that's already this good? And you said that it's, um, it, this is a weeded bourbon. So <laughs> kind of talk about the mash bill for this one. So whenever we made our mint julep, we used our Ezra Brooks, which is a rye bourbon. 10% rye goes into the mash bill right here. And then we do 20% uh, wheat into our weeded bourbon. Uh, whenever you're a distiller and you make whiskey, all right, you always need to have corn if you're making bourbon by law that's required. Distillers always use malted barley. Uh, you use just a little bit, about 10% on average. It doesn't add a lot of flavor, but it produces a lot of alcohol. Malted barley is yeast's favorite food. So you put that in your mash bill to get the yeast excited and start making all that alcohol for you. And it really speeds up your process and gets you a higher yield. But we use what we call a flavor grain. And the two most popular choices would be rye and wheat, all right? And rye will give your whiskey a spicy dry finish and wheat will give your whiskey a long sweeter finish. So sweet wheat or dry rye, all right? Those are your two options. We make both because we like to have it all. Um, so the Ezra Brooks goes really well in things like juleps because that spicy dryness combats that sweetness of that simple syrup really mm -hmm. well. Right? And then in a drink like this highball, a weeded bourbon is just perfect because that long finish, I always use the word crescendo. 
The flavors of this whiskey just continue to crescendo and build on your tongue as you drink it. Uh, I really, really enjoy this. Nice. So we got our whiskey in there. We're mm -hmm. gonna add a little soda. Bit of soda. And then we're gonna get a nice lemon. So yeah, grab your lemon. Uh, you got a peeler or a paring knife, whatever yeah. you got. Perfect. And then just a nice big strip right down the side, all right? Mm, it smells like heaven. Perfect. Now, I see a lot of people, you go to, perfect, you go to a lot of places and they'll just throw that in there and be done. That's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna break the oils of this, of this, and then, so we're gonna right over the top of our glass, squeeze it just like this, and then give it a good rub right around the side, just kind of like how we spanked our julep. All right, we're going to get that nice lemon essence all over the rim of our glass and then stick it deep down inside there. Nice. So cheers mm. to you. Cheers. I love the way that that lemon pairs with the whiskey. That's delicious. Yeah. And um, yeah. isn't, isn't David Nicholson actually a St. Louisan? Isn't there a great story about that? That's actually very true. David Nicholson... Uh, was a grocery store owner in St. Louis back in the 1800s. He had his, his main shop was right on 6th Street downtown. Um, and he had a very illegal habit of distilling in the back of his store while selling whiskey out of the front of his store. Uh, and legend has it that what he didn't sell out of his store, he would drink with his friend Mark Twain. Uh, there are a number of Mark Twain essays that reference drinking with his friend D. Nicholson. I believe this to be the same person. So I believe it too. Why yeah. would it be anyone else? <laughs> Who would drink? But yeah, so uh, David Nicholson was a real life St. Louisan, which is why whenever Luxco was looking to get into the whiskey business, this was actually one of the first whiskey mash bills that we secured. All right, because we knew what this was and we knew where it was from. Luxco is a St. Louis-based company. We are globally headquartered right here in downtown St. Louis, right off of Clark Street, right by the stadium. Uh, and we wanted to bring some of that St. Louis history back. Uh, so not only, we now currently distill all of our whiskeys in Bardstown, Kentucky, but all of our products are actually bottled and then distributed uh, across the globe right here in St. Louis, Missouri as well. So our bottling plant employs about 300 St. Louisans. That oh, wow. Up. So. And it's a family-owned company, right? Yes, we are 100% independently family-owned. You cannot buy Luxco stocks on Wall Street. Uh, we do not have a board of directors that comes and tells us that we need to make them more money every, every day. Uh, we have an owner that comes to work and says, how do we make better products every single day? And, and that means the world to me. That's why I'm here. And that's why I love talking about these products. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, what's really interesting is being able to taste these two, um, you know, whiskeys side by side. They're so different. I mean, they really have very different characters. And I've, it's got to be the, the rye versus the wheat. And that's also exactly. the level of alcohol. Because uh, these two whiskeys are close to the same age. All right. Um, we do a, almost a straight four year on the Ezra. We do a little bit older on the on the David Nicholson. Uh, and this is 90 proof, this is 100 proof. But you're right, that, that rye in the Ezra, it's gonna hit you right on the tip of your tongue. You get all the flavor really fast and then it's gone, right? The David Nicholson, again, the word crescendo keeps coming to mind. It builds and builds and builds on the palate, which is why it makes such a great highball. <laughs> I'm glad we're doing this for three weeks in a row. This will be fun. We're going to do this again. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. our next and our third um, cocktail actually uses tequila. Oh, it, it does. See, we are, Luxco is the largest global spirit producer in the world, and we do more than just make whiskey. Uh, we do produce uh, tequila, and we also have a great vodka line, Pearl Vodka. And we actually make a whole lot of other things, cordials and this, that, and the other. But I'm very excited because this is my first time using the new packaging out of the El Mayor bottles. So, well, and it's beautiful. I actually, I have a, a bottle right here. It really is beautiful. 
Yeah, they're gorgeous. Uh, this is we we just changed the the packaging this year, and I was really really excited. And this is the first brand new bottle with the new packaging that I've got my hands on. So I love it. So we make uh, we we are partners with another family uh, in Jalisco, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, Dallas family is fourth generation distillers and owners of our distillery. Uh, and we've been partners with them from the very beginning. And they make Exotico tequila and they make El Mayor tequila. Uh, Exotico comes in Blanco and Reposado. And with our El Mayor, we do a Blanco, Reposado, Anejo. We even do an extra Anejo. And you're going to start seeing a lot more innovation as well. We have a really nice rum cask finish tequila. Ooh, coming. Cool. So could you, um, somebody just commented, new bottle, same grape juice. So there you go. Um, but could you explain the difference between like the Blanco, the Reposado, like all of those different types? I don't know if everybody's super familiar with that. Absolutely. Blanco is what comes right out of the still. All right, it's unaged, it comes out of the still, it's ready for bottling, it's similar to vodka, or, you know, looks like water, nice crystal clear uh, tequila. Reposado is aged for uh, at least a minimum of three months. We always age ours a minimum of nine months, all right? We, we like to be a little extra. We always like to deliver great products at great prices. So this is at least nine months old. That's a guarantee from us. All right, and then an anejo by law must be aged a minimum of 12 months, anejo meaning year in Spanish. Um, <laughs> and then extra anejos must be aged at least 18 months. Um, and so you do all that. So it's really just how much time does it spend in a barrel? Now, when we make our bourbon, we say by law, it must be a new American white oak charred barrel. So mm -hmm. a bourbon distiller uses a barrel once and then it becomes useless to them. All right, so where do they end up shipping those? They either send them down to Mexico to make tequila, they can go to the islands to make rum, scotch, Irish whiskey, all those guys are just buying up empty bourbon barrels. Um, and it was funny because five years ago, we were begging distilleries to take barrels from us, you know, because they just pile up outside if you don't. Yeah. Nowadays, with bourbon being so popular, a used bourbon barrel will sell for triple its original value because craft beer distilleries want to age their beer in them. Everybody wants them. But we all signed all these 20-year contracts 10 years ago because we were sitting on too many barrels. So, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see the barrel economic futures as these contracts line out. Yeah, definitely. So let's start making the cocktail, but I definitely want to talk about um, when you and I had a chance to catch up this week, uh, the agave shortage. Yeah, I think we should talk about that. So it's always interesting, um, you know, just like whiskey needs to age in a barrel, um, and that takes an element of time, agaves take seven years to mature to the point where you can actually harvest them and distill them for tequila. Um, and so it's amazing to think about the pressure for an agave farmer to know, what do I need to plant this year? How much agave am I going to be able to sell in seven years from right now? Let me check my crystal ball, all right? So you always think that you know the answers, but then, you know, just like bourbon had this great, huge resurgence where it's growing in popularity, tequila is doing the same thing. All right, so you, as people drink more and more tequila, again, we needed to know seven years ago that this was going to happen. So if you're unprepared as a tequila distillery, right, you start having to source other agaves or, or find other things that you can do. And what we're really finding is a lot of agave producers uh, that sell a bulk agave to distilleries are kind of watering down their crops out of this. Mm -hmm. All right, and so it's really easy for a distillery right now that says 100% agave tequila to actually end up having not 100% agaves in their in their stills and their cookers. What right? could be used instead of an agave? What could be substituted? Um, there's a, a number of different agaves are part of the succulent cactus family, so and they're, they're huge. I mean, yeah. they're massive. 
uh, an agave pina is going to be about at least half the size of me. Yes. You know? uh, if not, it, you can let them grow longer and they'll get even crazier and bigger. So, yeah, they are very, very large. Uh, but a lot of times, too, you know, if all I'm doing is sourcing and buying agaves from somebody else, they could already have milled that. And then, you know, you get them in pellets. Like beer producers don't buy hops anymore. They buy hop pellets. Yeah. Right? So uh, producers like to just grind it down, put it in a pellet, sell it to you, it's easy to use. So, but the secret is at El Mayor in Jalisco, Mexico, we not only own and operate our distillery, we own and operate our agave fields, right? So the, while the family is distilling, we have our, our family is also growing all of that. We have complete control over every aspect of production from beginning to end, which is something not a lot of distilleries get to say. Yeah. That is your grapefruit soda that you just opened up. Absolutely. You know, it's <laughs> funny. I call this the porch Paloma because, you know, I mean, when you make cocktails for a living, like sometimes I make Palomas that I'll freshly squeeze the grape juice and I'll char some rosemary over the top of it. You know, you do all these fancy things. Uh, but then I was like, you know, I really just feel like doing something nice and easy and refreshing. And this is how I make my Palomas at home anyway. But I really, <laughs> this is the traditional method of making Palomas in Mexico. I would not have guessed that. I would have guessed that they were all grapefruit juice, but no, grapefruit soda is the go-to method. So it's easy. It, I mean, I think that we all, we all can have, you know, the aspiration of doing something complicated, but when you're at home, being able to just, if you want that flavor, being able to pull out your bottle of El Mayor tequila, your, you know, your can of grapefruit soda and be able to make a really great drink. I mean, you're much more likely to do that when it's easy. Uh -huh. um, we you know, uh, just said, we call those patio pounders. Exactly, which is why, <laughs> why it's nicknamed the porch paloma. I mean, it is, it is just that easy. Uh, and it's perfect for drinking outside. So we're gonna cut our garnish here. I just cut a nice little wheel, gave it a little slit, and then uh, I'm going to use this ridiculous tool that has a knife, a bottle opener, a zester, everything in it. But, Is that like uh, a utility bartender's tool? It, it's called a it's called a barbarian. And yes, it is. It has every bar tool imaginable. In it. <laughs> it's like yeah. the Swiss Army knife of of it's the bar crazy. world. <laughs> but, I need one of those. So we'll put a little bit of lime juice in there because tequila nice. and lime are always good friends. But then, yeah, we're just going to top it with some squirt soda. And, I mean, it's got everything you need. It's got that sweet. It's got to, to cut through the, the sour of the citrus. Uh, it's got the sugar. It, it's absolutely perfect. I mean, this is, again, one of those, I'm just going to sit outside and have a few of these kind of drinks. So. Nice. Well, and I'm drinking um, the tequila just straight as a sipper and it is be the the reposado the 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 rested tequila it has that wonderful roundness that the barrel kind of gives a spirit and if you did want to just have this like on a little bit of ice it's delicious the reposados are always my favorite you should always judge a distillery by their blanco and i always judge an italian restaurant by their cheese garlic bread you should always <laughs> judge a tequila distillery by their blanco <laughs> because since we slow roast them, you get that nice smokiness out of the Blanco, which really the, the extra sugars from the bourbon all right, that this barrel was used for first uh, actually starts to combat some of that sharp smokiness that you get out of the Blanco, which I do have an appreciation for. Yeah, I like that. When it comes to making cocktails, this is so round and so soft and so perfect. So we have a question. Can you make a Paloma with a different citrus? Does it have to be grapefruit? Uh, traditionally, yes. Uh, grapefruit is the go-to uh, citrus for a Paloma. Now, that being said, if you're at home and you're, you're looking at all your lives and you're going, what am I going to do? Or all your lemons or whatever you got. Uh, yeah, go ahead and put some tequila in it and call it whatever you'd like. But uh, a Paloma, by definition, is a grapefruit-based drink. So would you recommend specific citrus with this particular tequila? I mean, is it best with lime? Could you use lemon? Could you use orange? 
you you could absolutely do any anything you wanted. Um, Lemon would be a little too bright and aggressive, I would think. You know, I mean, we we put just a little bit of lemon in a hundred proof bourbon, and mm -hmm. and, you, and you saw the impact that that little bit of lemon had, right? So I, I couldn't imagine, you know, doing a squeeze of fresh lemon and some lemonade in here. I mean, that would just be that would be a lot. Uh, but uh, but lime juice always goes really well with tequila. A little goes a long way when you're doing green citrus. I'm actually thinking some fresh orange would probably be really good with this. Mm -hmm. I would agree because it's sweet. It has like a kind of a, a, a real sweet character where the grapefruit's going to be a little bit more bitter. Absolutely. And cocktails are all about balance. So if you're using a different citrus, you know, maybe you would want to go to the herb garden and really pick something out, you know, maybe so, some fresh rosemary or something like that to help bring it all together. So. Well, cheers. Cheers. Dustin, thank you. Kat, this has been absolutely fantastic. I know. It's really, really fun. And so everybody who's watching, this is the first of three happy half hours or ish, a little more. We've been going a little longer than half an hour um, that we're going to be doing over the next three Thursdays. And Dustin is going, oh, somebody just said, how, how, how about a Paw Paw Paloma? Would the Paw Paw be too mild? Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Because it's Paw so custardy and sweet. Paws are amazing, right? Uh, yeah. I actually know there's a local bartender here, uh, Andy Printy from Bull Rush, who does a lot of work with pawpaws because uh, they actually do everything they use as you know, foraged and all that. Uh, and he makes some great drinks. There's a lot of prep that he has to do with that, though. I mean, they're not the easiest fruit to work with. So, yes, you could do it, but it's not going to be that open a can of squirt and squeeze a lot <laughs> kind of Awesome. Well, so we're going to be here same time, same channel next week. And you're going to have three entirely new cocktails to share with everybody along with all these tips and, you know, tons of history and, and insight on cocktails. Dustin, this is really fun. Thank you very, very much. It was great. Uh, and sneak peek next week, I'm actually going to do my first cocktail with our new gin. That just Ooh. Very, I love gin. Really? That's my favorite. I'm a gin girl, so I'm looking forward to that one. That'll be great. All right. So, I'll talk to you then. Here. Thank you so much. Thank you. No one knows that.